and welcome John Swinney. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and thank you, David, very much for your, your very kind introduction. David talked about how um, I came last year and uh, I didn't use my prepared speech and uh, I made it up as I went along uh, after conversations with you all earlier on. Uh, well, I've done much the same again today, other than the fact that I made it up as I went along as I came in the car here today, and I just suddenly had this awful thought that I wrote it on the back of a piece, one of my government papers, and I just happened to write it on the back of it, and I suddenly thought, if I turn this over, is there anything sensitive on the back <laughs> of this that I need to worry about? But I'm quite confident this is perfectly able to be seen by the naked eye uh, this morning, so we won't get into any difficulty there. I want to, uh, David, we didn't talk in any way about uh, his introduction to me, um, but David's comment about uh, starting off on a note of pride uh, is the perfect introduction to what, uh, of, of my starting point to you today. Um, at the end of last week, uh, I spent three days in Finland at the International Summit on the Teaching Profession, along with Jean Grey, the head teacher of Inzivar Primary School in uh, Fife, well, in Inzivar and Salon Primary School, and also with Larry Flanagan, the General Secretary of the EIS. And the International Summit on the Teaching Profession is a gathering of, well, it's basically where a government minister a teaching, uh, a professional association leader and uh, a, a teacher goes along and takes part in international discussions around with about 30 other countries and at that event we have to make commitments about how we're going to take forward the things that we've learnt and understood from that conference. And it's the third one that I've been to and the critical point, and this is my note of pride, is that you only get asked, you get asked. You don't, you're not entitled as a country to go to the International Summit of the Teaching Profession. You get asked if you are a representative by international standards of a high performing education system. That's what you've created. A high performing education system by international standards. So when you read in the newspapers, about greeting awful, moaning assessments about Scottish education, which I read all the time and which annoy me and frustrate me because they don't bear out what I see in schools around the country. Remember, we are part of a high-performing education system in the world that's been created by your endeavours in schools around about the country. And that's something that we need to be immensely proud of as a country. Not to rest on our laurels about it, but to recognise that contrary to the characterisation that goes on about Scottish education quite frequently in the media and in parliamentary discussions, we have actually created a high-performing education system that is serving the young people of Scotland well as it's currently constituted. Now, is it perfect? No, it's not perfect, but it is a high-performing education system, and that should give us pride about what is being achieved uh, by all of us. Now, the other uh, opportunity, uh, and within those discussions at the International Summit of the Teaching Profession, there was a lot of focus on what is going on in Scotland uh, at a number of different levels. I'm going to talk through a few of those things in the course of what I'm going to share with you this morning. Um, so the idea that somehow we have got, um, we're in a position where we've got lots to learn from other places, that's true, and I'm going to talk a wee bit about that about Finland particularly this morning, but there's a lot of other education systems looking at what we're doing in Scotland to see exactly how we have done it, why we have done it, and what lessons they can learn for their own education systems as a consequence of the steps that we've taken as a country. Now, in the course of the, the, the few days I spent in Finland, we had an opportunity to, to see it firsthand, the uh, approach that's been taken in Finland, which is regarded generally as probably the best performing education system in the world. And we had a chance to see in practice what was going on in different settings in early learning, and in initial teacher education, but we also had the opportunity to 
here a very comprehensive, detailed, and what felt to me pretty dispassionate presentation about how the Finnish education system has got to where it's got to today. And I want to talk about some of the key characteristics there and to reflect on where we are in that journey. I'm not trying to put forward a proposition that says, just because they do it in Finland, we should do it in Scotland. And I'm not trying to say to you, we're about to import the Finnish system in all of its um, elements into Scotland. I'm simply saying it's important that we learn lessons and think about where we are on the journey that we're interested in taking forward. And there's four major elements of the Finnish education system that struck me as being really important for any education system to reflect on. The first, and for me the by far the most important, is moral purpose. The second is it's driven by partnerships and collaboration. The third is it's made clear curricular choices. And fourthly, it's got a strong profession. Now, if you give me one second while I just fire up my iPad here, because I want to talk about one slide that I saw at this presentation. If I, I thought I had it in the right place, but I didn't have it in the right place. Oh dear, here we are, right. Moral purpose. This is in the Constitution of Finland. Everyone has the right to basic education free of charge. The public authorities shall guarantee for everyone equal opportunity to receive educational services in accordance with their ability and special needs, as well as the opportunity to develop themselves without being prevented by economic hardship. That's a moral purpose. That's what an education system needs to do. That's what the Scottish education system did for me. I went to Forrester High School in the west of Edinburgh. I didn't come from a privileged background. My, I didn't come from a family that was poor, but you know, my parents worked hard. And I went to Forrester High School, a school with many challenges and a community with many challenges. It's still a, a community with many challenges. And I got an education that ticked that box that allowed me to overcome the challenges I faced to go on in life. And that's the moral purpose that underlines um, the Finnish education system. That was an extract, by the way, from the Constitution of Finland, a written constitution. In my humble opinion, in the current debate in the United Kingdom, we could perhaps do with a written constitution to help us navigate our way through the difficulties that we face just now. But clear moral purpose must lie at the heart of any education system. And in that respect, and I've just written about this in the Times Educational Supplement this month, and by the way, if you want to understand what's in my head on a monthly basis, just read my column in the Times Educational Supplement once a month, because it's basically a download of what I'm worrying about, thinking about, fretting about, trying to advance on a monthly basis. But I think Scotland's in a really strong place in the moral purpose that we have in education. Uh, I am so proud of the way in which our whole system has taken the aspiration to deliver excellence and equity for all within our education system directly into every school in our country. I would be supremely confident of being able to go into any school in the country and see that moral purpose being displayed to me in the actions and approaches being taken by teachers. In some schools in the country, as with everything, it will be more emphatic and more effective than it is in others, but that's a challenge for us to try to advance. But I would not be able to go into a school in Scotland and not see that moral purpose on display. And that's a tremendous tribute to everyone in education, at, uh, in, in the teaching profession, in local authority leadership, who have bought into a shared agenda about the moral purpose of our education system and how we intend to take that forward. So if we compare Scotland to Finland on the question of moral purpose, I think we've got a really pretty firm moral purpose of pursuing excellence and equity for all within Scottish education so that we overcome some of those barriers to education and to learning that David talked about in his introduction, that we actually think through what, what are the barriers to this young person being able to fulfill their potential? What are they bringing to school that is baggage that impedes their ability to learn? And more and more, we're seeing the, the instance of, um, and the effect of poverty, 
and deprivation being a barrier to the participation of young people in education. We see the implications of adverse childhood experiences on education. But equally, we see many examples of how those challenges are being overcome by the professional interventions of teaching professionals. So moral purpose is the first thing. The second thing is it's the Finnish system is driven by partnerships and collaboration. In this respect, well, I want to pay tribute to STEP because STEP is one example, a very early example, and a really good example, and a really deep example of collaboration amongst professionals within the Scottish education system. But if I've got a criticism, it's that we don't have enough steps. We don't have enough connections and networks of this type of practising teachers. We've got loads of collaboration at senior management level. They're never out of meetings. <laughs> but we need to have more collaboration amongst teachers and we need to create the time and the space to enable that to happen and the mechanisms and the culture to make that happen and that's what I hope we're going to create out of the pay and workload deal that we've reached with the teaching unions of which I'll come on to talk about a little bit later. And of course the necessity for greater collaboration within our education system was one of the key recommendations of the OECD when they reviewed Scottish education in 2015, they talked about our many strengths, but they said you are deficient on collaboration and you need to encourage and facilitate more collaboration. And it's got to be collaboration amongst professionals, not amongst just high hegens. We've got loads of that. We need to have more collaboration amongst teaching professionals. Um, the third element uh, of the Finnish education system, which I thought was crystal clear, was the curriculum choices that they had made. And they've made their choices, and we've made our choices. And interestingly, there's a lot of similarity about the curricular approaches that we've taken. Because we, of course, have gone for a curricular approach, which, um, well, the first thing to say is I had nothing to do with it, so it all preceded me. Um, and so I'm taking no credit for this. I'm a, I'm a dispassionate observer of it, but I think the right curriculum choices were made by my predecessors in both the Labour and Liberal executive who started the debate about CFE and in my, predecess my predecessors in the SNP government who have carried on that train of thinking. So we've had about, fifth, well probably longer than that, nearly 20 years of thinking about shifting to a capacities and skills based curriculum uh, which started with a national debate which emerged out of some of the frustration about the 5 to 14 curriculum, which was viewed to be too rigid and too inflexible, and that move into a capacities-based curriculum where we are trying to ensure that we create successful learners, effective uh, contributors, successful learners, and responsible citizens. And as David said, frankly, in 21st century life, that's what we need to create effective contributors, responsible citizens, successful learners, and confident individuals for two reasons. One, because that's about providing young people with the kind of range of moral aptitudes and capacities and capabilities to navigate a world that's full of danger and instability and angst and worry, but also a world that's changing, secondly, at a pace that none of us have experienced in our lives and therefore creating a fixed base of knowledge to, con to convey to young people in 2019 in the hope that it might be relevant in 2021 is in my humble opinion a forlorn hope. We need to be creating the capacities to adapt and to change and to reflect on changes in our society. So on curriculum choices, uh, I think we've absolutely, we're on the money. I will defend curriculum for excellence until I am blue in the face. And I can see instances where Parliament begins to moan about curriculum for excellence as another shorthand to have a go at the education system. And I promise you, I will vigorously resist that because it is a stupid challenge to mount against our curriculum. Because again, what's attracting a lot of international opinion is the curriculum choices that have been made in Scotland that are now being looked at in other jurisdictions to say that is the type of curriculum 21st century society is actually required to have. And Scotland got there first. And we should be very proud of that reform. 
So on curriculum, um, I think we are, um, we're on the money with our curriculum. So the fourth element of the finished system that I thought was um, substantial and significant was the strong profession. And this is, and, and I, I think it's reflected in the sense of autonomy there is for the teaching profession, uh, the trust that is placed in the teaching profession, the focus in the profession on professional development, and the respect that's uh, held, that the profession is held in within uh, that society. And I think this is where we have to concentrate a lot of our efforts to make sure that we strengthen uh, the position of the profession within Scotland. And uh, I think we have got a lot to learn from the Finnish education system about how we can ensure we have got a sufficiently strong profession to enable us uh, to achieve all that we want to achieve. Because if we don't have a strong profession, we will not be able to deliver our moral purpose. We will not be able to deliver and fulfil the <coughs> curriculum if we don't have a strong profession. And that's where organisations like STEP and networks like STEP have helped to create that strength in the profession, but where I want to make sure that's a big focus of what we do and what we take forward in the years to come. And for me, the approach into that is through the centrality of empowerment of the teaching profession. And you'll hear me talking a lot about empowerment in the period going forward because I view it as absolutely central to tackling all of my aspirations about the education system. There's two practical elements to how we take forward the empowerment agenda. One is the head teacher's charter where we will put more power and more influence and more scope and more flexibility into the hands of head teachers in schools over curriculum, over staffing, over financial decisions and choices to make sure that learning can be can be designed as close to young people as it possibly can be. Because who is better equipped to make the judgment about the educational needs and requirements of individual young people than the teachers who are teaching those young people themselves? Nobody else is going to, I, won't, I can't make that judgment better than you can. Your local authority directors of education, in my view, can't do it. You're the ones who are in front of the young people. You can see where they are, what they're about, what they're facing you are best placed to make that judgment. So putting more power into schools through the head teacher's charter is an important element of that. But the second and equally important element of the empowerment agenda is teacher agency. We have to make sure that teachers are empowered, but more importantly, feel empowered to be able to make those critical judgments about the educational journeys and uh, approaches of individual young people. Because without that, we will not be able to fulfill the curriculum. Because our curriculum is not some set of tablets of stone that are delivered, it's the judgments, it, is, it, it hinges, the successful delivery of our curriculum hinges on the judgments made by individual teachers to bring that curriculum, for, uh, that curriculum to life to make a meaningful impact on the educational journey of individual young people. And we will only do that if we have an empowered profession, confident in its own judgments, confident in its ability to make the right calls in relation to young people's education. Now, that confidence amongst the teaching profession, which is, I suppose, how I would translate what I mean by teacher autonomy, that sense of professional confidence that lies within each and every in individual teacher within a classroom is the prize that I think has got to come out of the empowerment agenda. Because that will enable us to bring to life the curriculum, but it will also help us to create the opportunities to advance professional learning uh, for, uh, for teachers within our schools. That for me is one area where STEP has contributed a great deal, but where the rest of the system has not contributed as much as it needs to contribute to enhance the professional learning uh, for individual teachers. So, and, and also uh, to create the space uh, to enable that to happen, which brings me on to uh, the issues of workload and the nature of um, 
the pay and workload deal that we've reached with the teaching profession in the last couple of weeks. Uh, and I, I'm pleased that we've reached that deal um, because I think uh, we've taken a number of big steps in that uh, deal which properly respects the profession, which properly ensures that we um, have an approach to tackling the workload issues going forward in, in a spirit of partnership between the government, local authorities, the professional associations and teachers themselves. I've been given a lot of thought to the issue of how we tackle the workload pressures that teachers face. And I've listened to many, many teachers talking about this. I've had a number of different round table events with teachers privately, just in groups of teachers with me talking about this particular issue. And the conclusion I've come to, listening to what teachers have said to me, is that I, I, you know, I personally and the government and national authority does not have the solution or the capacity to solve the workload issues. You know, we've had a tackling bureaucracy working party. We've had thematic inspections of every local authority in the country. We've done all that kind of stuff and it's not tackled the workload issue. What we need is we need to change the culture within Scottish education on these questions. So let me give you an example of a conversation I had with a, an experienced teacher in the northeast of Scotland where we got to, for me, probably the sharpest distillation of the workload problem. This was a secondary history teacher, a very experienced teacher, and he taught me through the fact that he was confident in the way in which he gathered information and assessed pupils to give him a picture of how pupils were progressing and what they needed, what he needed to do to shape their learning to make sure they were able to achieve their potential. He was able to formulate that judgment and he could record that as to how he was doing that. So he was totally confident in that. This was not an underconfident teacher. The problem was that having done that, that critical exercise, the most important exercise, he then got asked to do it this way, that way, the next way, the other way, by the government, by local authority, by a QIO, by the head teacher, by the head of faculty, by the fear, the fear of we might be inspected. <laughs> and what that said to me is that fundam in, in the, go back to what I said to you about Finland and a strong profession, autonomy, respect, trust, CPD. So what I had in front of me was an experienced, strong teacher who was engaged in the CPD. He knew his onions. He knew where his pupils were, and he had confident in his, confidence in his judgment. But the system essentially came at him 101 different ways to undermine his confidence. I don't know if it actually did undermine his confidence, because he was pretty kind of... <laughs> he was pretty bullish about all this. <laughs> but I could see how difficult it would be for a teacher to say, look, I've got my judgment here. Why do you need it that way? Why do you need it this way? Why do you need it that way? When are the inspectors ever going to come? You know, his school had been on inspection alert for seven years. <laughs> seven years. He also said, we're waiting for the box to arrive for the inspection. <laughs> And the Chief Inspector of Education tells me no boxes ever arrive and have never arrived for some years as well. <laughs> I use that to illustrate a cultural problem because that's a cultural problem within the education system where we are not dealing, we're not operating against the principles of autonomy or trust or respect. So for me, this is the big ticket item. This is the thing we've got to crack. And I'm going to, in the, the letter, the offer that I made to the EIS a couple of weeks ago, uh, which I hope you're all voting for, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> never, never, never miss an opportunity, you know. <laughs> I would point out the EIS are recommending acceptance of the deal as well, just to keep me, just to keep me on the right side of trade union interference. But... Uh, in that exchange of letters, you know, there is a, you know, there's a monetary offer 
um, you are going to continue to get paid, I can assure you. Um, but there was also a commitment to jointly work between public authorities and the professional associations to tackle that culture. One teacher said to me, um, not long after I um, came into office, a really confident teacher who was not for, you know, who was not for taking nonsense, said, if something has got nothing to do with a learner's journey, I don't do it. If it's got nothing to do with a learner's journey, I don't do it. Now, that's the type of professional confidence that we need to inculcate within our education system so that we, we create that different culture, that culture of autonomy, respect, and trust. But there was a fourth element to that of what I talked about from Finland. Autonomy, respect, trust, and CPD, professional learning. Because we have to be devoted to professional learning. And that's where STEP has contributed significantly to this agenda already, and I look forward to that carrying on in the years to come. Because the approach I'm taking on workload isn't necessarily to um, enable you to leave the school earlier in the day and have a shorter work in life. I'm not that, I'm not that, I don't want you to mistake me for a benevolent individual. Nobody ever thinks I'm a benevolent individual. But it's to create the space for you to have the time to do the professional learning. Because that's what I think is different. You're here on a Saturday morning, engaged in your professional learning. If this was to run on a Friday morning or a Thursday morning, most of you couldn't be here because you couldn't get out of your schools. So we have to create the space by getting rid of the, the crap, frankly, which is getting in the road. And I've decided I can't decide what the crap is you are more equipped to decide what the crap is <laughs> and to engage constructively with the assistance of your professional associations and a change of culture within the education system to try to tackle that issue. And that's not me. Pa don't, please don't think that I'm passing the buck. I hope it doesn't sound like I'm passing the buck. I'm trying to say to you, I've, I've gone through a lot of thinking about how we need to get to this destination. And I think we can only get there by changing culture and changing roles and creating a more empowered profession that's more professionally autonomous, that's more trusted and more respected in all that it does. And I think the pay and workload deal that we've arrived at is, um, gives us a unique opportunity to try to advance that agenda combined with the wider work that we're undertaking on collaboration on professional learning and on strengthening the professional capacity of the teaching profession. Now, <coughs> the last thing I want to say to you, because I've spoken for far too long, is, uh, is, is, is one other reflection from the International Summit of the Teaching Profession. Um, there was a, a really immensely detailed presentation about education on societal trends that was shared with us by Andreas Schleicher, the Director General for Education of the OECD. It was a really rich, deep presentation on educational and societal challenges, which draws on some of the issues that, were, that our young people are having to wrestle with about the impact of social media, what they are exposed to, what they see, what they see about some of the you know, events, the terrible events in Christchurch, and what that, how that's portrayed to them, and what that does to attitudes within our society. And this really deep and rich presentation covered much ground in that respect. But one comment left, leapt out to me, which is of seminal importance to, to my outlook on Scottish education, and it's this. The best school must be the local school. The best school must be the local school. We've, uh, Tuesday this week, uh, uh, the Herald newspaper did a, a, a set of league tables of uh, the, the, the supposed performance of schools in, in, in Scotland. And I, you know, uh, you know, they do these things. That's part of life. Uh, we just all have to live with it, I suppose. But it doesn't represent for me the appropriate assessment of Scottish education because for me, 
and driven by the best school must be the local school. For the constituents that I represent in rural Perthshire, if people live in the village of uh, Kinloch Ranach, uh, Bridalbin Academy in Aberfeld has got to be a good school. Because if they want to go to another school, it's another hour away. And it just doesn't work. And it doesn't kind of, it doesn't, this idea that there's got to be some great choice debate and competition debate within education is not the right thing. We should be, the values of Scottish education must be that your local school must be the best school. That wherever you go into the school, as I went into Forrester High School, um, a school that some people would say, oh my goodness, you're going to Forrester. Shouldn't you get a placing request for John to go to Craigmount High School up the hill? No, no, I went to Forrester High School and I got an outstanding education. And that's what young people and families should be promised the length and breadth of our country. But we will only get there if we focus on the moral purpose of education, which is to, to deliver excellence and equity for all. And that is characterised by the work that we're doing through the Scottish Attainment Challenge and pupil equity funding to put the resources into school to help us close the poverty-related attainment gap. And we'll only get it by strengthening the professional autonomy of the teaching profession to enable it to be an outstanding profession of quality that is autonomous, is trusted, is respected to transform the lives of young people in Scotland because that is what you are all here for and why you're here on a Saturday morning to enable that is the, to be the case. So for me, keeping central in our thinking that our moral purpose is to deliver excellence and equity for all and for us to deliver that by making sure that our local school is the best school by our efforts is the right way to drive and to progress all of our thinking. Now, uh, my very, very last point is about those league tables the other day. A big hullabaloo about um, the, the, the ranking of schools. <coughs> what that data did not have, you know, you got a big screaming headline about the range of schools. What that data, what there wasn't a screaming headline about is that attainment at every level in Scottish education is up. Up. Was that screaming out at the front page of the Herald? No, it wasn't. But at every level, least deprived and most deprived, attainment is up. And that's another element of why we should be proud of the Scottish education system, because we are delivering. We've not got to the end of the journey on excellence and equity, but we are delivering on that journey. And you should be proud of what you're contributing to all of that. Thank you very much. I think lots in John's presentation that would be music to everyone's ears, the most powerful part of it for me, that final statement, the local school has to be the best school. And we've undermined that in the past through parental choice, through league tables, through competition. And to have that endorsement, if I move back to comprehensive education, as the baseline and benchmark of quality in Scottish education is enormously encouraging because that reflects the history of comprehensive education in Scotland. Really powerful book on 50 years of comprehensive education in Scotland absolutely decimates the argument for market forces in education as a means of selection and driving improvement. And again, John, that's something we should be proud of. A few requests from me. Um, I think it's really important, John, when you focus on the big messages that we also think about doing the things that are easily done. I think it's interesting that you're talking powerfully this morning about autonomy and taking on the message of Elvis Presley, indeed, that we can't go on together with suspicious minds. I think that's a um, hugely important message, but there's an advert out just now for a Deputy Director of Scrutiny for Education Scotland, and I'm not sure that these two languages fit together just as well as they might. Um, and I think it's worth our while considering what the language we use says at every stage. I hope that also while we talk about workload, what we'll get back from our colleagues in these discussions will be the things that we note and control at our own hand. But what we need is an assessment system that rewards the practice that we attempt to inculcate. 
If teachers feel overloaded because the demands of assessment for content coverage are intense and immense, they will not find the time to deliver the wider agenda. And I think that's a huge issue for schools. They need to be vouchsafed that assessment will reward them for those things that we advocate and encourage in terms of our wider discussion. We also need to ensure that that accountability agenda is absolutely clear. And again, it's an enormous source of pride in Scotland that we rarely inspect our own advice, but we need to make sure that we don't stray into that territory because that's what's bedeviled accountability in England. And alongside that, I think some of the other simple things we can do, the documentation that we have should speak to the endorsement of practice. Voluminous documentation suggests criticism and a demand for change. Concise documentation suggests a commitment to practice. And so looking again at some of the burdens and experiences and outcomes, I think there's about 40 million of them, and as a result of your demonstration and commitment, we've managed to get 4,000 benchmarks to add to that. <laughs> and I know that, I know that many but of they're, you, but they're, I know that they're, many of you but, but they're useful. <laughs> And I know that many of you were at Victoria Key chanting, what do we want? Benchmarks. <laughs> when do we want them now? And, and they're useful. But if we're going to put in something useful, we need to take the previously useless stuff out and we need to make it clear to people that that change has taken place. Because I think the difficulty is that people respond to uncertainty with overcommitment. And it's that idea of getting clarity around assessment, clarity around accountability, consistency around the way that we make clear the demands that we make of the profession that will make that cultural change. But it needs to be careful, it needs to be thorough, and it needs to be at every level. And we've got wonderful endorsements, Skell represented here today, which I think beyond any shadow of a doubt, one of the outstanding leadership organisations and initiatives in any country in the world, open, meaningful, engaging with the profession and engaging with leadership at all levels. And we need to make sure that the culture of scale becomes the culture of Education Scotland. And I think we need to have real consistency around that. I think what you've done brilliantly is picked up on the messages from last week's international conference in Edinburgh, organised by Osiris with John Hattie, and the point that I made in my workshop, which was attended by three people, um, <laughs> because, because it was on at the same time as John Hattie's. Um, I was standing room only in his, and somebody actually brought their dog to make the numbers look better in my session. So I was actually presenting to three teachers in a Yorkshire Terrier. It was a first <laughs> for me. But the point that I made was the question, what works, is a stupid question. The question, what works here, is the appropriate question. And that's exactly what John's picked up on this morning. Let's stop asking the question, what works? Let's stop the quest for silver bullets. Let's look for local solutions based on context, based on knowledge, based on the understanding of need. And the good news, John, is that John Hattie was saying that now when you look at effect size, the highest effect size in terms of impact on pupil attainment and achievement is collaborative cultures amongst teachers. Mm -hmm. And if there's a commitment to making time through that by addressing staffing models, by reducing some of the bureaucracy, by using straightforward tools that look at impact as opposed to time and effort, and by making sure that that culture is consistently followed through, not only in terms of action and in terms of language, I think we will get a uniform commitment from the profession within Scotland, not simply teachers, teaching assistants, other colleagues working with schools and other services. You will get that groundswell that you look for to make that cultural change. And you need simply, I think, to be careful in the consistency with which we nurture that. But we could not have had a better rallying cry to start off the morning than the one we've had. We couldn't have had more genuine compassion and interest and willingness to engage. And I'm absolutely delighted that John's been prepared to make the time to come here and share that with us and also listen to the few helpful hints that I've been trying to give him <laughs> around what the future course might be. Because I might never get in a focus group. Do you know how it is? It might just be like three, three teachers in a Yorkshire Terrier in my focus group. But there you go. John Swinney, thank you very much. And absolutely bang on time. We're now moving to workshops, but he will have to make his way through the room. If you want to ask